Hello, I'm Stephanie Ruff. And I'm Aviva Nabeski. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage from leading riders to local level dressage heroes. We're talking training advice, showing tips, and sharing stories to inspire your own dressage journey. So tune in, then tack up. Welcome to another edition of the Dressage Today podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Cosequin. Cosequin ASU joint and hoof pellets contain quality ingredients to support joint and hoof health, leaving out fillers like molasses and alfalfa, all while delivering the taste horses love. The colors of our ingredients shine through for a difference you can see. Visit CosequinEquine.com to learn more. And thanks everyone for joining us today. And to start off, we want to say a big congratulations and welcome back to our international dressage <laughs> team silver medalist, Aviva. Hi, it's good to be home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you survived your trip. Barely. And yes. barely. <laughs> But you did. And actually, I want to tell everyone that you wrote a great article about about all the details that is on the Dressage Today website. And I will actually put a link to that in the show notes. Um, So the Reader's Digest version, if you can sum up your trip and give us the highlights. Okay, well, that's easier said than done. But I know it is. (laughs) So it. It really and truly, it it was an amazing, wonderful, awesome, exciting experience. It was the trip of a lifetime. And I'm just so glad that I did it. And I had so much fun. Um, it was not at all the trip that I had expected it to be. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing that we had set up was that we were going to arrive in Israel on July 6th. And starting on July 7th, we would be trying the five horses that had been set aside for the three of us as potential lease horses. And, you know, we had two days to try the horses and decide who we wanted to ride. And then we got to ride for the next week or so before we started competition the following Monday. Um, So everything went according to plan and that that we arrived in Israel on the 6th and on the on the 7th. Um, Rebecca and Lauren and I met out at the barn and we tried three of the five horses and um, decided to stick with the three horses that we tried. So that was great. Um, And it was the horse that I had seen on the video that I had selected that I thought was going to be a good horse for me. His his name is Dan Dan, and he's what they call an Israeli mutt, which (laughs) basically means that he was bred in Israel and nobody really knows what his parentage (laughs) is. (laughs) And he's he's a chestnut with some chrome, which is everybody knows is my favorite. And he's been competing all year at third level with an adult amateur. And he's been he's been doing well. Um, he's not the most extravagant mover. He's older. He's 20. His legs look every bit of 20. (laughs) Um, and he's not, he's not a particularly complicated ride, but he's not, he's not an easy ride either. Um, but I rode him on Thursday and you know, it, it, it wasn't a great ride. And but it was good enough and went back to the hotel. And that night I called my trainer, Cheryl Lohn, and I said, you know, I want to talk to you about it. And I told her about what I had done and how he had reacted and this, that and the other. And we came up with a plan of attack for the next day, which was Friday. So on Friday, the three of us again met at the barn and um, Rebecca had a really good ride on the horse that she was going to lease. And I had a fabulous ride on Dan Dan. I was delighted. Um, and Lauren's horse had an abscess. Oh, <laughs> so Lauren was sort of starting over from scratch again. Um, and Saturday was supposed to have been a day off, um, for me and Rebecca, but because we had come with Maccabi USA, it was our day off, but Lauren who came privately was able to go and try a couple of other horses. 
So she ended up riding, fortunately for all of us, another horse that was at the same barn. Um, but that Saturday, um, both Rebecca and I um, tested positive for COVID and unfortunately went into quarantine and we're not allowed to ride anymore yeah. and we're sort of stuck. Yeah. So um, Rebecca was considerably sicker than I was, but I didn't feel great. And of course, I was very stressed about the fact that, you know, I needed to ride a horse in international competition and wasn't getting to ride him. Right. Um, but we were in a beautiful hotel. I had a, I had my own room. I had a patio. A bunch of us, you know, COVID quarantiners would all come <laughs> over and have breakfast, lunch and dinner out on the patio. And we were out um, in a beautiful green area with big banyan trees and wild parrots flying around and beautiful, beautiful flowers. And you could walk. It was a it was a good long walk. It was probably a little over a mile, but we could walk to the cliffs that overlooked the Mediterranean and we could sit and listen to the sea. So, you know, if you're going to be in quarantine, that was sort of the way to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It really wasn't the plan. Um, and then we weren't sure whether or not we were ever going to get out of quarantine because the <laughs> rules kept changing. And <laughs> finally on Thursday, um, they told us, and that was Thursday, I guess the 14th, they told us that on Friday, um, Rebecca and I were going to get sprung and they were going to send us to Tiberius to meet up with the rest of the equestrians. So Friday morning, they put our luggage in one cab and put us in another cab. And we went on a little parade up to Tiberius and checked into the hotel. Um, and the next day we finally got to go to the barn to actually, you know, see the horses and see yeah. the venue and, you know, meet the rest of the people who were competing and catch up with Lauren and um, actually ride. Yeah. And at this point, um, Rebecca had decided that it was a lot of money to spend on a lease on a horse that she didn't feel physically capable of riding after a week of quarantine. The horse that she was that she was supposed to have leased is a like a 17 two hand pre St. George horse with really extravagant movement, really, yeah. really tricky. And so she made the decision that she was just going to go with a pool horse because it was less expensive and was going to be a little bit easier to ride. So she ended up with a really lovely um, imported um, warm blood horse um, that was still a little bit on the tricky side, but not nearly as complicated as the horse that she was going to lease. Right. So, you know, we got out to the venue on Saturday and let me tell you, it's called the, the double K ranch and they are primarily Western um, rainers <laughs> um, and they also um, work cattle. And I mean, it was just, they, they, they pulled out all the stops for us. They actually put in a brand new arena with brand new footing for, for the games. Wow. Um, you know, they had set up all of these beautiful viewing areas. There was VIP seating, which had food and drink and appetizers. And just, I mean, it was, it was a really, really lovely venue. Um, and the stabling was permanent stabling, not tent stabling. And, you know, it, it's really interesting because they provide the venue provides everything. They provide the bedding. They do all they do the stalls. They muck stalls. They provide all of the hay um, and they feed. You leave your feet out and they feed for you. So it's sort of like a full service operation, which is yeah. kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, so we, we finally got out there on Saturday and because it's really, really hot. Um, it's about 25 miles from Tiberius and it's up in the mountains and it was over a hundred degrees, but there's always wind up there and <laughs> it's wind. It's not breeze. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, 20 mile an hour sustained winds. It's yeah. very windy. Um, so we were only allowed to ride basically in the late afternoon and the evenings. So we had our, you know, our window of opportunity to ride. And I, I got on Dan Dan and we rode in a covered arena um, and I started riding and I felt like, you know, I pretty much started where I had left off, you know, a week and a half earlier or a week earlier. Um, and I was having a really good ride and I was thinking, you know what competition is, you know, the day after tomorrow, I think I can do it. And all of a sudden I hit a wall. 
<laughs> I went from, I feel really good to, I'm about to die. <laughs> um, and I, and I looked at everybody and I said, I need to get off. <laughs> and Dan Dan's groom came running over and, and grabbed the reins and I managed to dismount and stood there and my whole body was shaking. Yeah. And I, it was, it was bad. And I realized that, you know, COVID had taken out a lot more than I thought. You know, I, I found myself, I was having a hard time getting air. Um, I wanted to pull my shoulders in around me rather than opening up and opening my lungs. Um, my core felt really mushy. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is, this is not going to be good. Yeah. But, you know, I'm here. <laughs> so the next day, um, we had the opportunity. We were each given eight minutes to ride in the competition arena under the lights to prepare our horses. Right. And of course I was the last person to go. Um, and so again, I, I warmed up in the, in the covered arena and I was feeling pretty good. And I went to go into the competition ring and it's huge. You know, it's, it's, you know, this ring that's, twice the size of a dressage ring. So the dressage ring is centered in the middle of it yeah. and there's stadium seating all around it and the lights are on and all of the stadium seating is cast in shadow and there's all this wind and there are flags, <laughs> you know, all the nation's flags and the Maccabi international flags and all these flags and they're just whipping in the wind. And I thought, I'm going to die. <laughs> this is the end. And I went into the ring and I asked Dan Dan to listen and he went right to work and it okay. was like magic. It was so incredible. There was music playing and I rode around the arena in each direction just to get used to the tents and the, and the, you know, the, the flags and everything. And then I went into the ring and I rode pieces of all of third level test two. And I felt like I rode well. And I came out of the ring and I said, I'm ready. I can do this. Um, so it was very, very exciting. Yeah. And the next day was, was, well, and that morning we had done the jog and I'd never done a jog. And somehow I ended up being first for the jog. Um, <laughs> and he passed. I'm really glad that they weren't doing me because I don't think I would have passed. It right, right. But we passed. So we got, we got clear to ride. And, you know, Monday was competition. And unfortunately, there were only nine dressage riders. And we were divided basically into two classes. There was the senior one, and those were the second level riders. And there were five people competing. And then there was senior two, and we were the third level riders. And there were three Israelis. Two of them rode third level. One of them rode second level. And they were all the Israel champions at those levels. Right. Of course. Riding their own horses. Right. And then, you know, there were the three of us Americans, you know, Rebecca riding a horse who she sat on twice. I'm riding a horse that I've sat on four times and Lauren riding a horse that she's been on for, you know, a little over a week. And then there were three other people who competed for Germany, France and the Netherlands, all of whom have dual citizenship with Israel. Mm. So they were riding their own horses. Right. So, you know, clearly it wasn't a level playing field, but that's OK, because that wasn't why we did it. Right. So Monday comes and it's time for competition. And I they had drawn names while I was still in quarantine. So I was the last rider. And so I went into the ring. And again, it was just this magical experience. I, I walked into the ring and my and my first thought was, oh, my God, this is being live streamed. <laughs> People are watching this all over the world, you know, I mean, whoever thought of it, you know, but people, right. my friends at home are watching this yeah. and, oh my God, I'm riding a horse. This is the fifth time I've sat on him and I'm riding third level test two. And this is international competition. And these are two judges. One is from Belgium and one is from the UK. And, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then the bell rang okay. and I halted. And I organized myself and I patted Dan Dan and I said, let's do it. And I went off and I rode. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I had talked about on another one of our podcasts that my trainer had told me that I had to do some schooling shows because I had, yeah. hadn't been down center line in six yeah. years and yeah. I had to. And she spent probably six to eight weeks with me working on 
the movements of third level test two, third level test three, and the, the FEI junior team test, which was the individual test that we rode. And going over the nuts and bolts and how to ride and how to prepare for the movements. And I went into the ring and I rode and it was the coolest thing because it was almost like I was riding tiger because I had, I knew what I needed to do to set Dan Dan up for every single movement. I had time to set up every single movement. I wasn't worried about where I was in the ring or going off course. The, the mantra that, 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 Cheryl has always said, and that Rebecca and I took over for the games was you can do anything for six minutes. Right. Yeah. And so you yeah. know, I'm just saying it's only six minutes, you know, Dan Dan doesn't have a real good medium or extended trot and he's very hard to sit. And I just kept saying, it's only six minutes. Yeah. You can do anything for six minutes. And I just, I, I, I went for it. Like the final extended canner, I thought, I'm just going to do it. And I mean, we flew down the long side and then all I did was just lift my core and he came back and I went down center line and I finished the test and I knew I had made some mistakes because, you know, you do, but I was thrilled. I was absolutely yeah. thrilled. And I came out of the ring and um, I think I had a 64. Um, one of the judges had placed me third. The other judge had placed me fourth. The combined score put me last which was fine. Um, I was one percentage point behind Rebecca. I was thrilled, absolutely yeah. thrilled. You know, I walked out on a cloud. So the next day is Tuesday and we're now there. It's the reverse order of go. So I'm now the first of the four riders to go in third level and we're riding third three. And there's this really, 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 really long break between the senior one and the senior two riders. And I'm not really sure why. And I'm ready to go. <laughs> and finally the chief steward said okay Aviva they're ready for you and I walked over to the ramp to go from the cupboard to the competition ring and I dropped my whip because you know you can't ride with whip right and Dan Dan said aha you dropped your whip <laughs> and he had been pretty good in the warm-up but he'd been really funny all day he he stood with his butt to the gate and when I hand walked him it was like I was dragging him and he wasn't really interested in treats and there was just something wrong you know but he warmed up okay and I thought I'm gonna be okay until I got into the ring and he tucked his nose onto his chest and he planted all four feet and I thought I'm stuck yeah, I literally, I can't, I can't move this horse. I don't have a clue what to do. And then I heard, you can do anything for six minutes. <laughs> and I swear to God, I lifted that horse up and I carried him around third uh, level test three. <laughs> uh, and it was not a good test at all. He was, you know, behind my aids is understating yeah. it. You know, when we went from the, from the extended walk to the medium walk, he not only didn't go forward, he went backwards. Yeah. I thought he was going to rear. Um, I actually had to steer him off the rail. You know how you knock them off balance to get them yeah. to move. Yeah. Um, and then I had to pick up the canner and then go through the short side and start the half pass. And I, you know, couldn't walk, try to get into the canner. <laughs> And I kept saying to myself, you must canter by F because you have to half pass in the canter. And somehow I managed to canter and I managed to get through the whole test. And I don't know how many of our listeners ride in a double bridle, but usually the snaffle rein is a thicker rein and it has, it may have stops or it may be laced. And the curb rein is a very thin, yeah. smooth leather. And this particular bridle, the snaffle had stops every inch. So it was very bulky and the curb rein was laced and the laces were untying. Oh, and I was riding in my Newman tackified gloves, which they don't make anymore, which I save for competition. And I got, I got trapped in my reins and I kept pushing my hands forward to give Dan Dan a place to go. Yeah. But I couldn't actually let go of the reins themselves. So it was not pretty. It was not a free <laughs> ride. But I did it. Um, and you know, 
horses are not machines. And right. he was not a happy camper and he didn't want to do it. And I came out of the arena and I said to his groom, what did I do wrong? You know, because it's got to be me, right? What did I do yeah. wrong? And she said, he didn't poop. <laughs> he has to poop before he goes in the ring and he didn't poop. <laughs> There's not a lot I can do about that, right? No, so, not a whole lot. So, you know, I was last. Okay, I was last. One of the judges gave me a 60.6, which I thought was very fair. The yeah. other gave me a 58.6, which I thought was very fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was a 59.6. And, you know, we, we had enough between my points and and um, Rebecca's points and Lauren's points. So clearly we won the silver medal. Right. But we weren't behind by that many points. You know, we were respectable. Um, and it was and it was very exciting. Um, Wednesday, we got the day off. The horses got the day off. And Thursday was the individual championships. And I got on Dan Dan and he was a different horse. Yeah. And I had taken him out and I had hand walked him on Wednesday and he had rolled. Um, and I think he just, you know, he had been at the venue already for over a week. And I think he was just done. Right. Yep. But I got on him on Thursday and he felt much better. And I went in and I rode in some ways, the best test I've ever ridden in my life. I mean, I just, I rode every single moment. I rode every single movement. I rode every single footfall. I made two really, really big mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, There are four flying changes in the test. And two of my changes were beautiful and expressive. And one of my changes was late behind. And that was my fault because I forgot to, I forgot to half halt. Yeah. You know, I just didn't prepare. And the second one was clean, but it was clearly behind my aids. It clearly wasn't when I started asking. And so the judges gave me fours for both of those changes. Yeah. And had I gotten even sixes, I would have won the individual bronze medal. Oh, but I didn't. Oh. And I made mistakes. And, <laughs> you know, I'm human. We're all human. Our horses are human. You know, we make mistakes. But I came out really proud because even after I made the mistake, I just kept riding. And, you know, there was a tremendous amount of pressure, but not pressure at the same time. And it was awesome. So, you know, that's the, that's sort of the Reader's Digest version. (laughs) That took a really long time to tell. Um, And then, of course, there was the award ceremony later that night. And, you know, we actually got to stand on the podium and I brought home this beautiful, really heavy silver medal. There you go. Um, And it was just the whole thing was just incredible. And I'm I'm so very, very glad that I got to do it. And I'm so honored that I got to do it. And I'm so grateful that I had such a wonderful horse um, because I felt I felt like I could ride him. Right. And, yeah. you know, the show jumpers had a much more difficult time. Um, they didn't get as much time to work with their horses. And, you know, show jumping is a, is a different ball game. Yeah, it is. And there was some scary stuff that happened in the, in the, in the show jumping. Um, there were some ugly falls. There were some ugly stops. Um, so overall, you know, I think our team was great. And I, I've made friends that I will keep for the rest of my life. And I have memories that I'll have forever. Yeah. Um, and I had the most marvelous time getting there. <laughs> and, you know, oh, we, 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 you know, we talked about how the Olympics got delayed for a year because of COVID and how hard right. that was for the Olympic riders because they were all set to go. And some of them then didn't make the team because once you peak, you peak. Yeah. But stuff happens. I mean, Stuff happened at, at 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 the game at the World Games, you know, just this this past month. You know, Ashley Holzer's horse was human and or, you know, was not a machine and <laughs> reared. And, you know, her very matter of fact way of approaching it, horses aren't machines. And you know yeah. what? Neither are people. And we all go out and we do the best we can at the time that we're doing it. And, you know, the 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 fact that I could come out of the arena, even on that awful Tuesday, that I can come out of the arena and say, I did the best I could at the time. Yeah. yeah. And in retrospect, I, I know that I made mistakes. There were some decisions that I made that were the wrong decisions, um, but I learned from them. Yeah. You know, and now I won't make the, hopefully won't make those <laughs> mistakes again. Um, right. 
But even if I do, I'm still doing the best I can at any given time. So it was awesome and amazing. And I thank all of our listeners and I thank Dressage Today and all of the people who supported me, you know, financially, emotionally, you know, in so many ways to to get there and who supported me through the whole quarantine (laughs) and everything. And, you know, thank you isn't enough. Yeah, but it's it's the best I got. It was fun to kind of follow along on your journey and we're glad that you made it back safely and in one piece and all of that. And, you know, nothing's ever going to go quite the way you plan, but no, no. And the funny part was when we were leaving JFK, we were delayed an hour. Um, And the reason that they delayed us was they said that there were 42 pieces of luggage that had um, unidentified um, things inside. Oh dear. And, and, and I think that might've been my stirrup irons. <laughs> oh, well, it could have been. Yeah. Yeah. I took my own irons just in case. So I just think, you know, we were on the plane with so many Maccabi athletes and the things that we bring. Right. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There was a lot of baggage inspections going on. <laughs> a lot of really weird baggage inspections going on. Yep. So yeah, nothing goes, nothing goes smoothly. No. Um, but as they say, these things that don't kill us make us stronger. That's right. And, and it was fun. Good deal. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing along the way, your pre-journey and your journey and your post-journey. And, um, you know, we'll have to see what's next. Um, I don't think I'm doing this again. So this is not <laughs> next. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. Our Ask the L question this month comes from Sue. When and how is the best way to switch your whip during a test? You know, our listeners have great questions. Don't they? They, Don't they? they, Yeah, (laughs) they, they really do. I think this is a wonderful question. So I have a whole lot of questions to ask before I even start answering that question. So my first question is, are you even using your whip? I see so many people who come in the ring and they never use the whip. So if you are carrying the whip because you just need to carry the the whip because your horse knows that you have it, carry the whip in the hand that's easiest for you to carry it in. Do you need to use your whip? If you do need to use your whip, do you find that you use your whip to activate the right hind leg or the left hind leg? Or are you using it on a shoulder? Or are you using it behind your leg? you know, on the barrel of the horse? Um, Do you need it more going to the right or going to the left? Think about when you actually use your whip, because if you can keep from switching your whip and just carry it in one hand through the whole test, that's really ideal, okay? Um, I see so many people who switch their whips every time they switch direction. Oh gosh. And it's a it's a big, it's a big deal, you know, because they haven't mastered that wonderful art of, you know, doing it while still holding the reins. Right. And so they, they get all fumbly and you know what, that distracts your horse. And if you're not going to use the whip, why do you keep switching it from hand to hand? <laughs> you know, so those are the things that you need to think about. Um, when should you change the whip? You change the whip when you need to, if you need to. And how do you change the whip? You go online and you, you, you know, go to YouTube and you search for how to switch your dressage whip and you learn how to do the thing where you put both of the reins in one hand and you reach across and you grab your whip. Right. And you do it quickly and you do it efficiently and you do it with as little muss and fuss as possible um, so that you don't irritate your horse. But that thing about, you know, reaching down and pulling the whip up and, and you know, swinging it around, <laughs> that's that's irritating to your horse. It's, it, it's a good way for you to hit your horse on the head. Yeah. Um, it's a good way to drop the whip. It's very distracting for the judge. And as I said, if you don't really need to switch the whip, don't. And if you're really not using your whip, but you really do feel like you need to carry it, some people are uncoordinated carrying the whip in their right hand. So carry yeah. it in your left hand. Um, there is no rule that says that you have to salute with either your right or your left hand. You can salute with either one. There is no rule that says that you can salute 
with the whip in your hand or you're not allowed to salute with the whip in your hand. There are some old school judges who really prefer to see you salute with your right hand. Most judges prefer to see you salute not with the whip in your hand. Right. Yeah. Most horses prefer that you salute yeah. without the whip in your hand. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to accidentally just flick the horse. Right. And you've got this perfect halt, and all of a sudden yeah. you salute and tap, and off goes your horse. And that, you know, 10 halt just turned into a four. Yeah. So, you know, if if you're worried about your salute and that you want to salute with your right hand and you have the whip in your right hand, either hold the whip with the thumb of your left hand when you salute or carry the whip in your left hand or yeah. keep the whip in your right hand and salute with your left hand. Yeah. But think about why you have the whip when you use the whip Um and then try if you do need to use the whip from one side to the other, because sometimes you do um, try to do it in a corner or in a movement where you have time. You yeah. know, lots of people do it in the free walk or the extended walk. Um, and that's really not a bad place to do it. Um, my recommendation is rather than doing it as you cross X or cross the center line as you do it closer to the end of your diagonal just because at that point you're going to be picking up your horse anyway so if your horse gets a little tense as you change the whip from one hand to the other right. you're already thinking about lifting the horse up with your leg and your seat aids and lifting your core and getting them rounder and more through and more collected into your collected walk or your medium walk or whatever and so it's not quite as obvious yeah so it's an excellent question it's something that i think you know, people need to think about um, and then they need to answer the questions about using the whip and make a decision on when they change based on those answers. But they also need to learn how to do it correctly. Well, yeah, and I was going to say it's something else to practice. It's yes. like everything and, else you have to yeah. practice. Switching and it is a skill set. It really is a skill set. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you can't do it fluidly, then figure out a way to switch the whip in a way that is least um, affecting your horse. Right. Because, you know, there's nothing worse than, you know, you're switching the whip and your horse does something stupid because you <laughs> accidentally hit it or you dropped the whip or you did something stupid. And, you know, that's that's one of those things that, you know, you can control. Exactly. So yeah. don't make a dumb decision when you can control it. There you go. Yep. Good answer. I like it. Thank you. All right. And certainly if anybody has a question that they would like Aviva to answer, feel free to email us or reach out to us on social media. Matt McLaughlin began studying dressage and the art of training horses in Haute Ecole for exhibition performances at an early age. He credits his early dressage influence on USDF Hall of Fame member Chuck Grant. Matt spent seven years working for the Royal Lipizzaner Stallion Show, where he trained as many as 16 stallions and riders at a time. In 2011, Matt was head trainer at the Arabian Nights Dinner Theater, where he restructured the equestrian productions Dressage, Liberty, Western, and Reigning Acts. Matt has continued to hone his skills as a trainer, clinician, and performer by learning and adapting techniques gleaned from training experiences, as well as his work with industry notables in the dressage, western, and trick training disciplines. Matt has successfully trained horses through Grand Prix Dressage that have gone on to compete nationally and internationally, as well as multiple horses finished in Haute Ecole, including Capriole, Corbett, and Lavad. He has earned the USDF Bronze, Silver, and Gold Rider Medals, graduated with distinction from the USDF L Education Program, and he provides instruction at his base in St. Cloud, Florida. Matt travels throughout North America and Europe as a clinician. So Matt, I want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Oh, absolutely. It's a pleasure. So to start with, uh, we'd like to get a little background information on you. So could you tell us how you got started in horses and then specifically in dressage? 
Uh, horses, I think I was put on my first horse by my aunt. She used to ride hunters. or still does, actually. And I think she's in her, I want to say she's probably close to 70 now. And she put me on my first horse or put me on a horse on the first time. I think I was four years old and mm-hmm. uh, I loved it. <laughs> I think and then got my first one myself when I was 10 and did the normal show 4-H and local hunters and and uh that slowly transitioned into eventing and and uh I also exercised racehorses when I was oh. a teenager. Wow. And then I got in a car accident when I was 17. My mom and I were actually on the way home from the barn and got hit by a drunk driver and I just kind of had a and nothing major, but it was still a, a misalignment of the Atlas and Axis. And if I was jumping and I was starting to jump much bigger things now, I was working with a jump jumper trainer and uh, I would get migraines. So mm. they said I couldn't jump for a year. And I was lucky enough. One of our neighbors growing up was Gunnar Ostergaard, uh, a dressage trainer uh, from Denmark. And he kind of, worked me into being a working student with um, Chuck Grant, who was in Michigan at the time. Right. And Chuck Grant wow. is a, is a, a, a USDF Hall of Fame member. He was sort of the father of dressage in this country. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That was, they used to call him the father of American dressage. He judged the first civilian dressage show, and <laughs> wrote several books. And, and so I was, I was with him for about a year and a half as a working student. And, and then just, it was always one thing after another, just the next thing was always sitting there waiting. <laughs> Where did you actually grow up and start riding? Uh, Pennsylvania. Sorry about that. Yeah. I grew oh, up, um, born and raised in Pennsylvania, born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, get a lot of crap from my girlfriend. <laughs> that, that, okay. Now I know why he thinks he's God because he was born in Bethlehem. There you go. So, <laughs> All right. Well, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania as well. So kudos to that. And um, which area? East, uh, West? Shippensburg, South Central. I I remember there was a there's a there's a college there. I think there is a college going to Shippensburg University. That's where my my dad taught for um, his most of his uh, his professional career. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you mentioned uh, Chuck Grant, and then, but as you progress then, you know, because mm-hmm. obviously you've reached a, a, a level that, um, you know, Grand Prix level and all that, who else, you know, who have you trained with? Who else has really influenced your riding over the years? Uh, I'm a big one on, I, I would, I love, would love to go, I'll, you know, watch shows, uh, you know, and, I was always lucky enough to just always have the gift of being able to, you know, uh, interact with people well. And um, there wasn't like specific ones that I would put as as um, absolute influences like Chuck Grant was because it was such a long yeah. period of time. But, um, you know, I have had there's been uh, less riders from the Spanish riding school that would come over and do clinics and that the owner of the Lipizzans would bring over and and. So there's no one specific, but a lot of a lot of a very well-rounded experience. And and I've had friends from reining and cutting disciplines. And so I'm a big one on good horsemanship is good horsemanship. And you know, right. maybe it doesn't apply directly to dressage, but there's something that you can implement in the training of horses. And especially with all with the entertainment in the early life, because I started with the Lipizzans, the the their They've been closed for years now, but the Royal Lipizzan show, when I was 23, I moved out to Vegas. They had a show out there. So what made you want to do that or get involved with that? How did that all come about? It had started, I, I, I first, I started with them when I was 23, but um, I was offered a job when I was, when I was a working student with uh, Chuck Grant uh, when I was 18. And at that time, I wasn't, you know, didn't think I was ready for it. And then, then at 23, they had offered me a job again, and it sounded great going to Las Vegas at 23. Oh, so. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many horses did you have in the show? 
uh, the show we had in Vegas, that was a permit. That was actually where we did all the training at that time. They did not have the training facility in Florida that they built a bit later. So we had, well, I want to say we probably had close to 50 horses, wow. not in the show, but um, we had all the young horses there and, right. and whatnot. So we were, uh, getting the ones that weren't prepared yet. We had some of the older ones that would come in from the road show that at that time, that was considered the stronger show. And then the road show was, you know, if I want to call it the weaker show at the time. And then that slowly made a transition that when they closed the show in Las Vegas and they moved all the horses to Florida and built a training facility in Oviedo, then they were, then they started putting the, the stronger horses out onto the, the, the road show. Okay. How long were you with the Lipizzans? Off and on. I, I started in 92 and I was with them until um, the end of 97 and uh, entertainment corporation had bought them out then. Uh, and within a year or so that entertainment corporation had bankrupted and I was living in Vegas at the time. And uh but the old owners restarted the show in 99. So I came back and helped them get going there. So probably a grand total of, and a lot of, I went back and just helped tune up the horses and my business partner, Lori Beggs um, was working for them full time um, here in Florida. So I was always back and forth, probably a, a total of somewhere between uh, maybe seven to nine years. Wow. Um, but there was a lot of just going back and helping for, you know, maybe a, a few weeks or a month or so at a time. And, what's it like going back and forth from something that's pretty much entertainment the way the Lipizzan show is or was mm. and you know classical dressage competing in in the Grand Prix and all of the other things I was more based I mean I obviously being with Chuck Grant it was more of a competitive background but that's where I started to learn how to train all the hot and and the tricks um, from him and then learned the above the airs above the groundwork as I worked for the show and, and a mm -hmm. few of the Austrians and and um, whatnot but um, at that time I was slowly making the transition and getting more and less and less as when I left the Lipizzans then it became more about competition even though uh, I started to get into uh, horse expos so I'd get hired to do dressage the be a dressage demonstrator but then i'd have my exhibition horses performing in the evening shows that you know like uh, uh equine affairs one of them at the pennsylvania horse expo we've right we did yeah. the midwest horse expo many times um went out and did the del mar night of the horse a few times and um so and that transition but all during that the tricks were actually secondary to me it was more and more and more about the competitive dressage and you know that's been over the past i was starting to fade i think i left the lipizzans uh, uh yes I, I went back but i left working for them permanently in i think 2000 2001 okay and then well, was in virginia with a lady who had built a facility and we'd started a business there and in texas for a year and then i've been in florida now since 2007 so is that where you got involved with the Arabian Nights Dinner Theater? They, I did. They, they approached me. I had known the owners, knew the owner's daughter, and the owner's daughter had hired me to come in um, to kind of, she wanted to really bring the, her uh, vision for the show was that she wanted to bring it up. And it, it was, yes, still very entertaining, um, trick-based. It was the, the theatric version, the theatric end of it. But she also wanted the horsemanship to start coming up um, yeah. more and more. And then then right when I started, she ended up leaving and then I was working with her dad and he was still a little bit more into the more you know pure entertainment end of it. But, you know, that was <laughs> I had my clients at home that were competition. And then I, went, I actually never rode in the Arabian Night show. Uh, oh, OK. I, I was only their head trainer, worried about training the horses, the riders. So. That was one I never, never rode in. Oh. Uh, uh, so, you know, so you've done a lot of different programs and different sorts of things. So how has the entertainment portion 
influence or maybe or has it influenced the traditional dressage training? Um, more if there's any influence, like at least from a training standpoint, it's um, very much that there's 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 many different ways to train thing and try to implement the two together is there's there's way too much focus on you can only do something a a one way and (laughs) this horse can't do that because it doesn't show the talent for well the horse showing a lack of talent as long as it has the physical ability that you're not going to break it down right i'm a big believer just like chuck grant was that most horses can do grand prix are they going to go compete at the olympics no but they can do most of the work my my one business partner, Heather Black, that's up in Atlanta now. She just moved up there recently. She has a little a paint quarter horse that, you know, she's going to show at Grand Prix. No, he was originally a rainer. Wow. And he's always been solid in the mid-60s, all the way, you know, 64 to 66%, all the way up through I-1. And, you know, he'll, he'll go Grand Prix probably in spring with her moving. She's had a lot of problems getting her arena set up. So she's, she's lost almost a year now, but um, there's always a way to, you know, to, to train them. And, you know, some of the, the entertainment circus methods, you have to, you have to add a, a component of correctness to it where sometimes it won't be. But if you can use at least a portion of it, you're like, Hey, that's a good way to teach the horse the concept. Yeah. Now we have to bring it back and make it more correct. And they work better through their back and better from their, from their hind end. If that, would, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would imagine there's also, you know, dressage horses are, are, you know, notorious for being so spooky and, mm-hmm. you know, you're so quiet when you're watching and we don't whoop and, you know, how <laughs> yeah. you do with whatever. Yeah, and and the entertainment part of it, you know, there it's it's so antithetical to the concept of, you know, the quiet right. classical music <laughs> playing in the background. I would imagine it's a great way to bomb proof horses as well. It really was. I used to when I used to do the horse expos, I used to always take a young horse along with me then either myself or I never did clinics where I brought in outside people. Because for me, an, a horse, a clinic is about the individual participants An expo and a demonstrator they call a clinician was more about the crowd. So yeah. I never wanted, I never brought, I never interviewed, you know, went through videos and, you know, let let outside people come ride in, in the demonstrations. And I always brought my own horses. I brought my own riders. That way I could control that because it was about the audience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know what I can get from, you know, someone that I don't know or I've never right. worked with. So I never considered that fair. These people are all paying money to be sitting there. I wanted them to have, <laughs> yeah. you know, be able to understand exactly and not not be at the not unfortunately be at the, the mercy of whoever happened to be the participant today. So but I used to always take a young horse along, too. And that was so fan. You know, there was some of them. There'd be 800. Or actually, there was some I think Midwest horse fair as well over a thousand horses show up and you know that was those those (laughs) young horses would come home from that they're like i don't care about a flower box (laughs) and i've always had the mentality and you know maybe it was from the lipizzan show and working with the austrians and then in getting so interested in the spanish riding school and some of their methods but um i'm a big believer that you know traditional classical dressage was training horses for war so right. they could not spook when somebody's <laughs> running at you. Yeah. <laughs> so That's a very good point. when horses spooked <laughs> back then. <laughs> and we've, we've kind of, we've lost focus on having, you know, and, and now to be fair, the horses are, you know, some of the horses are so much hotter and more electric than they were right. back then. Yeah. But nonetheless, that's all still a degree of training. If if you teach them that, you know, eyes, you know, I don't let my young horses go to strange places and just willy nilly look outside the arena and they have to stay focused. The work is in the middle of the arena. That's where I'm focused. That's where they stay focused. Mm -hmm. So and that has a that has a tendency to carry over to the horse when they realize you're that focused. So, yeah. 
Do you find that your training methods bounce back and forth from, you know, sort of the trick things to classical and back again, depending on the kind of horse that you're working with or the rider that you're working with? I wouldn't not. They don't bounce back with the trick so much, but I'm a big believer in, in correct natural horsemanship. You know, that that's become a name that people like to throw around because too many people are making money doing it, twirling a rope. Boy, should I have said that out loud? on the- <laughs> um, But I'm a big believer in, you know, rope halter work and whatnot. And I will bounce back a lot be- between, you know, your traditional thought of classical dressage training. And mm-hmm. I make, I, I remember one of the questions is, you know, what, you know, what's one of the methods that their favorite things that I do. And I am an yeah. enormous proponent of long lining. Mm-hmm. I fix most of my problem horses with on long lines and, but they, before long lines, they're introduced to, you know, how I expect them to move away from me with a rope halter. And that's what I bounce back and forth probably mm-hmm. more with that. I was actually there was I spent when I went out to Texas, that was originally because I was um, on tour with Chris Cox. I don't know if yeah. you guys are familiar. Yeah. And uh-huh. um, and and, uh, and I, I really am a big believer that those are techniques that apply to any discipline. It just doesn't matter what the saddle is. But, you know, it's not about carrot sticks. It's about learning a technique of teaching the horse to move away from your body. I'm not a big trick. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not about doing tricks and games. Right. So there's some of the methods are all about games. This is, it's not a game to me. It's about real horse psychology. And that means that you're, you're a fair leader, but you're the leader of the herd and that the horses have to look for you, look to you for the direction. So that's the way I heard. That's what they work in the wild. And that's the way, you know, I think of natural horsemanship as being that and really natural horsemanship is just some little offshoot of what original really good Liberty training used to be. So right. we want to kind of put Liberty together as, as um, into the entertainment thing. That's where I believe the good natural horsemanship comes from. And that I'm always shifting back and forth, especially horses that have, you know, some focus issues. Right. Well, Aviva has become a big proponent of long lining, right? Oh, I just had my horse long lined on the day before yesterday. And it was just, he's, he's an, an older horse who has had a rather checkered past and mm-hmm. watching over this year, seeing him long lined and seeing the difference in the way that he uses his body, the difference in the way that he comes through his back, his eye has changed, his interaction it has changed. It's uh, and get it, I, 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 you know, I got on him the day after he was long lined, and it's like riding a different horse. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, and there's no cheating, you know, it, it takes, <laughs> she knows exactly what I've been doing right and wrong based on how he goes in the lines. And, you know, it's such wonderful feedback for me. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that I took a chance on it because it's wonderful. And, you know, a lot of, as you're talking about the whole natural horsemanship that, you know, it's not a carrot stick. It's about getting the horse to respect you as the leader and to move his feet in the correct way. And, you know, the groundwork that people don't do because all they want to do is ride. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. You know, know, we were known for taking problem horses. That's kind of shift that I was, I had my, I had my, my, uh, my sacrum and my pelvis broken by a young horse four years ago. Believe it or not, he bucked so hard, he broke my pelvis. Not because they came off, because he bucked so hard. Uh, It's like two six-inch screws through my sacrum. Holy smokes. uh, You probably would have been uh, better off coming off then. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, I bailed out because my right leg didn't work anymore. I did go off, but I landed (laughs) on my left side, and I couldn't figure out why my right side didn't work. That's because my whole pelvic ring has also has a, a little steel plate and four screws, and then six nice. inch screws through my um through my um pelvis into the into my sacrum because it just it my sacrum is. cracked in half like a half an inch from my um spinal cord so everything has healed wonderfully it could not have healed better but um i'm also older i'm slower and i'm fatter so <laughs> i don't um i don't take problem horses um uh-huh 
to be um, that I'm going to fix under saddle, but I will take them and do long lining with them. And then the owner has to supply me with the rider, whether it's them or somebody else that's going to make the transition of everything that I've in, you know, installed, so to speak, in long lines. And then I had, and then I transfer that into the, the rider that's going to be dealing with the horses. Cause like I said, you know, we just decided Lori and I are too old. Or we're 53. Yeah. We're both 53. And we're just, I'm just not going to take problem horses anymore. So, but yeah. I will take them to do long lining with, and I can fix 99% of the problems from long lines. Like, like you said, Aviva, that, you know, it's, that they're going to be different horses, but then we have to teach the people how to interact with them different. Otherwise they're just going to revert back again. Exactly. I was just going to um, ask if you're still involved in any way in the entertainment industry or are you completely um, out of that now? I mostly am out of it. All of my exhibition horses are retired now. My <laughs> stallion, who's a briar horse, I, I actually bought when Arabian Nights closed and they sold their horses. The owner sold me a Palomino that I bought. Um, that was like the lead solo horse for the Prince Act. And um, I bought that horse and he's retired now. And, and uh, my, my old Grand Prix, one of my, one of my Grand Prix horses that I competed with, I used to take and do a ACDC back in black number. So <laughs> I had my white hand illusion, I have my Palomino. Um, and then I had um, Cooper that was a super dark bay. So he'd do back in black and everybody. <laughs> that was when I used to get emails from guys who went with their their wives and their girlfriends. I don't even like horses and we loved your act because oh. of the music. <laughs> so, yeah. So do you but, do um, a lot of freestyles then also? I do freestyles. I'll, I'll help clients. I don't, I mean, I'll only do them if a client really wants me to. I, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I, I really don't like the constraints that I'm put under in a freestyle because oh, literally I'm, I'm writing a, an organized, I'm writing a dressage test to music. Right. And with exhibition, yeah. you never know, you know, maybe a horse is going to look a little weird at one end of the arena or the people are in a different area of the arena. And so, you know, you'll always, I have a vague idea of, oh, I'm going to do this here. I'm going to do this in this time of in this part of the music, but you know, it's, I don't, I don't, Improvisation. I love, exactly. I love to shoot from the hip. So, <laughs> so but I do, I do freestyles, but I, I don't, I don't consider that one of my stronger points. And I guess if I focused on it more, I could make it better, but I, I just don't, I, I was so long of, you might have to tweak that, especially when you have horses that are doing five to nine shows a week, they got yeah. so used to how they could right. how they could screw you in front of an audience. So you had to be able to, <laughs> to change the act up and still keep it, you know, the generalities are all the same. Yeah. But to keep it fresh. Yeah. Right. Do you have a kind of horse that you prefer to ride? Um I I love I love Iberians. I love Andalusians <laughs> and Lusitanos. Um but I mean I I hate I hate going down the route of saying there's one specific horse. You know, we have, I have my barn. I just had actually several horses leave that were just in for um, like a couple months or a few weeks, just some quick tune-ups. And, you know, I just had a lipas on here. I've got an Irish draft. I've got quite a few warm bloods, um, worked with Frisians, where a client's looking for a gypsy vanner. I have my Andalusians. I've got my warm blood. Um, my favorite horse right now is a Lusitano that I've had since he was, or I've had in training since he was three and a half and, and uh, he's gonna, he's gonna go Grand Prix this year. So um, uh -huh. I love him, but he's, you know, also he's the ultimate horse in, in brain. He's so easy to work with. Mm -hmm. I wasn't actually thinking in terms of breed. I was thinking in terms of characteristics and you just said that it's the brain. The brain. The brain. I, I love the, I absolutely love horses that, that I don't constantly have to be worried about. I, I would, um, you know, I do like a hotter horse. I like a stronger horse in my hand. Um, how, so it's not, those aren't always the absolute most amateur friendly. I love right. it, but I love a brain that's all there, you know, and I'm yeah. not worried about, of course they're a horse. They can occasionally see something. The best of them can occasionally be caught off guard. But when you have a brain that's, you know, can instantly catch themselves, that's so nice to work with. Yeah. yeah. 
So you're involved in a lot of different things and in a lot of different ways. And you're you're judging, you're training, you're doing all sorts of things. How do you manage it all? I don't know. <laughs> I was going to ask for some tips. What tips would you give? <laughs> a good business manager. <laughs> if, if I, I mean, honestly, the person I miss the most right now is, and I say my business partner, but Heather's not really part of the business anymore. She used to always keep me so organized, but that was oh. because she's extremely organized. Okay. Now, my girlfriend is very organized also. Both of them are, are lawyers. By, you know, they went to law school, even though neither one of them works as a lawyer. One is a law professor. The other one is um, like an intelligence analyst. So they're very organized people. Yes, and definitely. Honestly, I kind of, kind of rely on them. Okay. And, then, and then the business partner that's with me here in Florida that does the training, Lori, she really keeps the farm running. Um, I don't have to worry, you know, maybe if there's some question on how I want to handle something, but I never have to worry about the horses being taken care of and whatnot, because that in itself is a full-time job. So, yeah. yeah. So your tip is to hire good people. It, absolutely. There, <laughs> there can never be, I mean, God, if, if, if we could only, if we could only get politicians to do that and hire <laughs> trustworthy people, maybe we'd have trustworthy politicians. But <laughs> we can't go there in this podcast. We no, that's why, I'm, that, that's why I'm not pointing any fingers anywhere. That's just collectively all of them. <laughs> um, but um, that's absolutely be surrounded by a, a, by a team that you can trust. Right. Or, at, yeah. or at least one person that, you know, you know, you can rely on. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got, I've got three of them. So well, then you're and lucky. Have, you're and I've got lucky. wonderful clients right now that, you know, they, they're, there is no problem if I'm not there for a few days and, you know, they, you know, they know they can go to Lori with something. Uh, that's, that's honestly the only way that I get things done. Otherwise I would, especially now just getting older, I would start to scale back a little bit. Right. Well, and then, okay, so you're busy doing all sorts of things. What do you enjoy that's not horse related outside of the horse world? Or <laughs> do you not do it in your life outside? I, yeah. I do. And, and I'm a, that's, that's one of the reasons I don't have a normal job is because I love to be able to just go, you know what, I'm doing something today or this weekend. And I don't have to worry about calling my boss and seeing if I can get time. Right. Um, I very much horsepower. I do everything you can imagine with with um, like vintage race cars. Uh, my uh -huh. best friend is also a aerobatics pilot, and owns an aerobatic plane. So I love doing going up and doing that with him. But him and I race vintage cars together. We build, restore vintage cars. Wow! Wow! I've got like a two thousand square foot shop that that um, you know, has has an old Mustang in it right now and. Um, I have a friend who restores Shelby's. A good, uh, I have a 428 Cobra Jet Mach 1, not a Shelby, <laughs> but <is>. an engine. <laughs> <laughs> so everything, when, when I'm not with horses, it's horsepower. It's horsepower. Okay. It's still aligned. Yep. Right. So funny. And the The last question is one that I like to ask everyone just to get their perspective. And... It is, what do you feel makes a great horse person? Experience. Um, there is just, that's, I'm so hard on young trainers because yes, they may be very talented, um, but it's experience. It's how many mistakes have you made is what's the mark of a good trainer. <laughs> because then you start figuring, you know, the mistakes are the only thing. I'm a big believer in mistakes are the only thing you can truly call your own. And they are the greatest teacher. I never want to do it that way again. Right. Um, I always joke around. If I sat on my first Grand Prix horse that I trained when I was 25, I know I would think to myself, what idiot trained this horse? <laughs> um, because every single one teaches you something more. And, the, and this, this Lusitano that I've got now is my 11th Grand Prix horse. You know, some were for entertainment, some were for competition. But um Nonetheless, every single one teaches you more. And, and, and that, that's the mark of a good horseman is, you know, their experiences, their mistakes and how yeah. they how they came out of them. And what did they learn on the other side of the mistake? I like that's that answer. Yeah, 
I haven't. I that that's we haven't gotten that answer before. No. I like that one. No, but you know, I I I've said that. I started writing when I was 32 and I'm 64 now. So I've got you beat, Matt. Um, but <laughs> well, sort of, of things, because that's 32 years. I'm 53 and I've been actually making money at this since I was a teen. So that's like 40 years. <laughs> yeah. So see, you, you got me beat. So, but, um, but, you know, one of the things that I say is that I will never catch up um, to people like you. I will never have the opportunity, the experience to sit on as many horses. And it does make a difference. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. I'm that's, really, that's... Yeah, I'm really glad to hear you say that because it's something that I've I've felt for a long time. And I think it's I see a lot of young professionals who, you know, hang out their shingle, their, you know, FEI trainers and they haven't mm-hmm. actually trained the horse. They bought a horse that was already trained and they rode it. Right. And yes, you have to be able to ride it. And that's a skill set. And it's not right. easy. Um, but having ridden one FEI horse that you didn't train doesn't put you in the same league with somebody who has made multiple yeah. FEI right. horses. That um, was always in my head. Chuck Grant <laughs> used to say, you're not a Grand Prix trainer until you've trained at least three because <laughs> now you've made enough mistakes to have a good idea how you want to train your young ones because you know for me the grand prix trainer is when i'm sitting on a first level horse i'm already addressing things then i'm not trying yeah. to get through first level i'm not trying right. to get to second level i'm thinking of you know what do i have to be doing now that's going to affect me in six months or in, in a year so right. And that only comes from experience. And, and you nailed it, uh, Aviva, that, you know, you have so many young, young trainers that, you know, they, they may have been, you know, very lucky and came from family that, you know, had the ability to, to buy them a good horse or something. And yes, showing is a skill set, but showing is not training. As a matter of fact, I know lots of people that I really look up to or or look at them with respect as far as how well they can show a horse and i would never i would never <laughs> ask them to train anything for me yeah you know, that's a that's a very much a skill set yeah so one that i still find myself trying to be better at because i was always younger especially when we didn't have things like, well, now it's gone, but center line scores or UFCF scores, or everybody could have their nose in your scores. Yeah. I took courses out and I didn't care what the score was because it's miles, but I had a hard time learning that you've got to stop training when you're in the competition ring. You know, that's your time to be a show rider. That yeah. took me a while to learn that. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, I've enjoyed it very much. and. Yeah. And so I just want to thank you for uh, joining us and sharing your story. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I think it was Cosequin that you had originally talked to. They've always been a fantastic sponsor for us and through a lot of years now, actually. Yeah. Yep. Well, Cosequin is the sponsor of this episode. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> they have, I have, they've always been, they've been wonderful to us. So Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. If you've missed any episodes or to subscribe, go to Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Learn more and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com, or you can visit our subscription video site, ondemand.dressagetoday.com. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Happy riding, and we'll see you at X. The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of Equine Network, LLC.